we have been uh, previously describing the overall control and regulation of blood pressure and blood flow through the cardiovascular reflex center located in the medulla oblongata. But, but in addition to this overall regulation, there is local regulation that occurs at the t individual tissue level. So this phenomenon is commonly known as autoregulation or active hyperemia. This is where local changes in metabolic rate of the tissue can cause local changes in blood flow. So basically, here's how this works. We've written here that any time there is a decrease in oxygen to a tissue, known as ischemia, or any time there's an increase in carbon, uh, carbon dioxide level at the level, tissue level, or any time there's an increase in acidity at a tissue level, or any time there's an increase in temperature, uh, where the uh, temperature of that tissue rises, if any one of these four things happens, and they commonly, as we'll see, commonly all occur at the same time, that causes the blood vessels in that tissue to dilate. There is localized vasodilation, and the result is an increased flow of blood uh, to that tissue where these local effects are occurring. Now, uh, just to, as an example of what it is we're talking about, let's just use the example of temperature. If you were to place your hands in hot water, so immersing your hands in hot water causes, that increases the temperature uh, of the tissues in your hands, and that causes those blood vessels in your hands to dilate, increasing the flow of, of red blood into your hands. And that's why your hands turn red. Conversely, if the temperature were to decrease, if you immersed your hands in icy cold water, that would cause the exact opposite to occur. That would cause local vasoconstriction, causing a reduction in the flow of red blood uh, to your hands. And the result is that your hands would look all pale, pallid, blue, uh, because of a decrease in blood flow to your hands. We take advantage of this local autoregulation phenomenon. Anytime we wish to increase uh, the blood flow to a tissue, we can apply a hot compress. Anytime we wish to decrease, reduce the flow of blood to a tissue, such as after it's been injured, you apply a cold compress or ice. The result is a decrease in blood flow to that tissue. Now, usually, all four of these things physiologically occur simultaneously. That's because the, what normally causes these four changes are changes in metabolic rate, in the activity level of that tissue. So, for example, if you start to exercise and use your skeletal muscles, those, uh, that increases the rate of cellular respiration, so that causes a reduction in oxygen to that tissue as the cells, as the muscle cells are using up the oxygen at a faster rate. They are also producing more carbon dioxide as a byproduct of cellular respiration in order to produce ATP. Uh, there is a localized increase in acidity for two reasons. Number one, the carbon dioxide reacts with water forming carbonic acid, an acid, and also whenever, to whatever extent that tissue isn't getting enough oxygen, lactic acid is formed. And fourthly, the, uh, we know that as cellular respiration increases, that generates a lot of heat because we know that over half the energy released from the breakdown of sugars, over 60% of the energy released from the breakdown of sugars in cellular respiration goes off as heat. So anytime there's an increased rate of cellular respiration, that generates more heat. So in other words, when you start to use your muscles, that increases the metabolic rate, causing all four of these uh, changes to occur within that muscle, and these localized changes cause the blood vessels in that localized area to dilate increasing blood flow. Obviously, the benefit of that is that increased blood flow will deliver increased amounts of oxygen to the active tissues. It will carry away the excess carbon dioxide. It will carry away the excess acidity, and it will act to lower the uh, temperature uh, by increasing blood flow. So that's how it compensates. And again, 
Uh, this is uh, symmetrical. If any of these four things go in the reverse direction, that will cause a corresponding local vasoconstriction and a reduction in blood flow. This phenomenon is known as autoregulation or active hyperemia. Hyperemia literally means increased blood flow, increased blood flow to that tissue. If we look on the next page, page 258, we were just describing how increased metabolic rate of a tissue uh, causes this active hyperemia phenomenon, increasing localized blood flow to that uh, uh, tissue. Uh, and we could imagine muscular activity increases blood flow to the skeletal muscles. You might imagine that increased uh, digestion of food after a meal would cause uh, active hyperemia or increased blood flow uh, to the digestive tract to promote or facilitate digestion of food and absorption of nutrients. We might ask, what about blood flow to the brain? Does metabolic rate of your brain increase or decrease? And somewhat surprisingly, the metabolic rate of your brain remains more or less constant, irrespective of what you use your brain for. So we wrote that since the metabolic rate of the brain remains more or less constant, therefore blood flow to the brain should similarly remain more or less constant. It doesn't matter whether you're asleep or awake. In fact, we've learned that uh, when you're in sleep, in dream sleep, uh, or rapid eye movement sleep, the EEG, the electroencephalogram recording or pattern of your brain activity looks identical to the brain activity recorded when you are awake with your eyes open. It's known as an alpha state. So there really some, seems to be almost no difference in electrical activity and presumably no difference in metabolic rate. It doesn't matter whether you're thinking or not thinking. You might imagine that if you're working on a difficult physiology exam, the metabolic rate uh, of your brain is increasing, but not significantly compared to when you're just daydreaming. And it doesn't matter whether you're sitting down or uh, exercising or running, the metabolic rate of your brain remains more or less constant, and therefore blood flow to your brain should remain more or less constant. What we've written next is the effect of chemical mediators of inflammation on the uh, blood vessels at the localized area of inflammation. Uh, we have previously learned back in section C when we talked about inflammation that many of the chemical mediators of inflammation such as histamine cause localized vasodilation. They cause the localized blood vessels at the site of injury or inflammation to uh, widen, increasing blood flow. Uh, this increased flow of warm red blood to the injured site is known as erythema. The area gets all red. And we've learned previously that the function of that, the purpose of it, is to increase uh, the delivery of white blood cells and antibodies to the site of injury and also increase the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the injured tissue. What we've written next is the effect of alcohol and nicotine on blood vessels. So alcohol and nicotine, which are drugs that are commonly introduced into the body, uh, alcohol has a vasodilating effect on blood vessels. It dilates blood vessels. One of the caricatures of somebody who's been drinking is their face may turn all flushed or red. Uh, that can be part in part due to alcohol dilating the blood vessels uh, in the uh, face. Uh, nicotine, in contrast, found in cigarette smoke, uh, nicotine causes vasoconstriction. It will constrict blood vessels, and of course, since nicotine is commonly introduced into the body by inhalation, so it will cause a constriction of the pulmonary capillaries to the lungs. Let's summarize the multiplicity of factors that might affect whether a particular blood vessel dilates or constricts. So here we have a cross-section of a blood vessel. We know that there are autonomic motor neurons innervating uh, the visceral smooth muscle in the wall. Some of these autonomic motor neurons may cause the blood vessel to uh, constrict. Uh, other autonomic motor neurons may cause blood vessels to dilate. The autonomic motor neurons, of course, are ultimately controlled uh, by the cardiovascular reflex center in the medulla oblongata for overall control and regulation of blood pressure and blood flow. 
But then there are a myriad, a multiplicity of local factors. Uh, nicotine, we said, is a vasoconstrictor. On the other side, we've already learned uh, the phenomenon called autoregulation or active hyperemia, an increase in metabolic rate uh, in, within a tissue uh, causes a decrease in localized oxygen level, increased CO2, increased acidity, increased temperature, and all of these factors tend to cause va localized vasodilation. Histamine, which is one of the chemical mediators of inflammation, uh, will cause localized vasodilation at a site of injury or inflammation. We've learned that alcohol is a vasodilator. So, in summarizing all of this, whether any given blood vessel dilates or constricts depends upon the overall sum of these factors that are affecting blood vessels. In addition, if a patient is taking any medication or drug, that drug that they're taking may also affect uh, vasodilation or vasoconstriction of blood vessels. So again, whether any particular blood vessel in the body dilates or constricts depends upon the sum of uh, all these factors.